Welcome to Sprinkle with Hope podcast with your host, Jason. We have an awesome guest with us today, Ken Niamatololo. He is the head coach of the Navy football team, and we are so excited. Shane and I love sports, and so we love talking sports, and, and so we're super, super excited to have Ken with us today. So thank you, Ken, for joining our show. Thanks for having me, guys. Excited to be on. Yeah, we really appreciate it. So, can it, can you kind of give us a little bit of a, a background of kind of where you came from, who you are, who's who's Ken Niamatololo? Well, uh, I was born in American Samoa, but I was raised primarily in Hawaii. My dad was in the Coast Guard, so he moved in a lot of different places. You know, he lived in New York, California, Oregon, but then he settled in Hawaii in the in the early seventies, and I pretty much lived there my whole life. When he retired, uh, we moved to Laie on the North Shore of Oahu. Uh, like I said, that's where I pretty much was raised on the North Shore, predominantly uh, LDS community. Um, you know, played sports my whole life. I'm a basketball player, football player, was a pitcher in baseball. So sports has been a big part of my life. My faith is a big part of my life. My family, like a lot of people. Uh, played at the University of Hawaii. Uh, stayed there and coached after. Um, came to the Naval Academy in 1995 for a couple of years. Um, got fired. Went to UNLV. Was there for three years. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, Coach Edwards was the guy really that helped me get that job. Oh, it's cool. kind of. I mean, it shows you kind of man he is. I mean, I've yeah. never worked with him. You know, I've you know saw him on the sidelines, met him at a couple of firesides, and talked to him on the sidelines before games, but. Never really worked with Coach Edwards, but I knew he knew John Robinson, who was the head coach at UNLV at that time, and he called and got me that job. And uh, then I came back to the Naval Academy in 2001 when Paul Johnson got the job again, who I played for, who I started my coaching career with, and was been at the Naval Academy ever since, going on my 23rd or 24th year in coaching at the Naval Academy. Wow. 14th year as a head coach be my 32nd year coaching been doing this a long time yeah, that that's really cool I'm, I'm sure that some might think at the naval academy it's hard to recruit players to come and play with you so how how do you find to motivate them to come and play with you and to you know just to keep that motivation up and to work really hard and how do you do that that's a great question too. i mean it's you know, recruiting is like any other school, you're, you're trying to sell what you have at your school and, you know, what what entice people to want to attend your school. Um, you know, first of all, we're looking for academics because academically, the, the type of students you're looking for to even be admitted to the academies, you know, it's, it's kind of shaves off who you're looking at in the recruiting process. But then also it, it shaves down even more because not everybody wants to serve in the military. Right. And... And we recognize that just because you don't serve in the military doesn't make you a bad American or a bad sure. citizen. And it's not for everybody. And so that gets dwindled down even more. But uh, we sell um, what our school has to offer, the education, the career opportunities after. You know, we've been a decent football team. So we feel like, hey, you come here, play good football, get a great education, set yourself up for life after. Um, recognizing, you know, we tell guys it's going to be hard, but most good things in life are hard and most good things you have to work for. And so we don't pull any punches in our recruiting process. We tell them this is what it is because yeah. it kind of weeds out kids pretty quickly. Like, uh, that's not for me. Yeah. Sure. But you just, you know, just, this is what it is. If you love it, come on, brother. If you don't, <laughs> we understand. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's one of the great things that you have about your program, you know, is that, you, you know, you're building men, right. To be, um, these officers in the in the Naval Academy. So, 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 how do you then, um, you know, prepare these men to be not just football players on the field, but you know, good, upstanding citizens of the community and and representing the Naval Academy like like you know we hope that they would, right? It's a great question, Jason. I mean, to me, that's number one. You know, we have a vision. Um, that everybody on our program has, a, you know, that we have this, you know, it's on a, a sheet of paper that's in everybody's office. It's in all everybody's um, rooms. 
but our why of our program is to develop young men of character and leadership. That's our why. Our why isn't to beat Army and Air Force and you know, go to these bowl games. Our why is to develop young men of character and leadership. And then our how and what we do is going to you know, win the Commander Chief Trophy, try to win our league and all these different things. But I feel like if your why is to win games, I feel like in this profession, that's why people sell their souls yeah, you know, to the devil, so to speak, because it's such a competitive, ruthless, cutthroat profession. If your why isn't clear, oh, that's my wife. I'm sorry, I feel my. <laughs> no, you're great. That, that's what family is for, right, Ken? Yes. <laughs> uh, it's my boss, anyway, so I gotta. Yeah. <laughs> so what ended up happening? We have an uptick of cases at the academy, so they of COVID cases. So they, they kind of shut things down a little bit. So we're back to, it's almost like last year. So we're back to working at our offices for at least 14 days to let us back in. Mm-hmm. But to get back to it, I, I feel like your why has to be clear and that's our why to develop young men of character. So really my number one coaching rule uh, for our coaches is treat somebody like you want somebody to coach your son. Mm-hmm. And so the, the foundation of our, our coaching is love you know, and so, you know, just we hold people accountable. That doesn't mean you have to swear at people. You can be demanding without being demeaning. Um, but really, a lot of the leadership stuff that I do in my team and coaching, I learned in my home and I learned in the church, being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so yeah. those are the, the two great leadership places that I've learned. And I find it interesting because I'm at an institution where it prides itself in being the, the, the leader and in, in, uh, the leading institution in leadership. Mm-hmm. But, and I've been to many seminars and had different places of uh, learning leadership in the ways of the world, so to speak, the way the philosophies of man. But my leadership stuff have come from my upbringing, mm-hmm. my, my religion, my, my faith, uh, my culture, you know, we're family oriented. So I, and I think it, it's, it's bode well for football because you're building a family. There's ups and downs, there's goods and bads, there's wins and losses, but you learn to stick together. You learn to, you know, put the family ahead of the individual. And it's some of the same things that I try to create on our football team. So yes, I want to win games in the, wor- in the worst way, but more importantly, I want guys to graduate. I want to create fathers and husbands, um, yeah. help them. And so I found is keeping your why clear is allowed, even through ups and downs of this profession, to don't break NCAA rules, to, you know, just keep yeah. recruiting right. Just, you know, just stay, stay on track, stay on track. You know, but if you don't, if your why is about winning games, I feel like it goes like this. And like I said, I mean, it kind of is crazy to hear that because in, my profession, if you don't win games, you get fired. Yeah. Yeah. But I've tried to get our structure where it's, it's on a firm foundation that it doesn't, you know, with the storms of a season, the storms of life, it, it, it's, it's rooted in place. And with the good and bad, you continue to keep going forward. I love the things you're talking about, because to me, I can see the foundation that you're building with your organization and your, the culture of the football team. And that, that leads to life. There's life after football for all of these kids. And I think if you're building that why and instilling that into them, then they're going to be better men in the future. And and that's on you. That's, that's you as the coach and as their mentor um, to have set that why and that foundation. Um, You've talked some about your family and your faith, and um, some might not know that you've also been in a movie. (laughs) Um, So Talk about that a little bit, about maybe family and faith and and those type of things. Well, you know, you know being selected, well, when I, we first got the call or the email, I'm trying to remember if it was a call or email <laughs> so long ago, but first of all, you know, we're like, you want us? <laughs> <laughs> Why us? <laughs> and, just, and said, okay. And, you know, and it was basically uh what people in our church are trying to do is just get different people from different walks of life from different parts of the world and just really just to show who we are members of the church of jesus christ last saints that we're normal people you know what i mean that 
they just want to show who we were. And so I said, okay. But it started off, I thought it was going to be like a movie at uh, the temple, at the temple visitor center that they just oh. show. But as it, it's, as it started to get going, you know, their, um, our producer Blair was just telling us, you know, it's, this might be a little bit bigger. And like, what are you talking about? Just, <laughs> well, you know, the way they're going, you know, they were talking with the leaders of the church and the brethren and people and just some of the thoughts that, you know, they liked what was happening with, you know, all the different families and the, what it was portraying that were just shows who we are. And eventually say, hey, that's, they're going to have a, you know, a premiere and it's going to turn into a movie You're like, whoa. So that's really how it inspired. It started from an email and a call, and yeah, we'll do that. And that, that's fine. And what do we do? Do we, you know, nothing? We just come and film you guys. You guys just live. So at first it was a little awkward. You know, they'd come, you'd be at eating, okay? Okay, we're just going to film you guys eating. And like, okay, uh, hi. <laughs> you know, you're, it became really, and they're telling, no, no, just relax, just be normal. But it's hard, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. yeah then you fabricate stuff that you normally wouldn't ask your kids, you know what I mean? Like, like, no, 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 just, just relax, just do it normally. And so it just, I thought, you know, it's cool for us to kind of meet the other families, you know, cause like I said, it, they weren't only from the United States. Yeah. So I thought that was cool just to see people. And um, again, it was just more of a movie just to show that our church is, we're just normal people, we're all walks of life doing a lot of different things. And I thought it was interesting because it's during the course of that season, um, that was a rough season for us. Mm. You know what I mean? It was a, so faith-wise, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it was something that tried me because like, hey, I'm here doing something to, you know, be faithful to, that, you know, because yeah. I, I love I love the Lord. I love my church and I believe in it. And then my testimony is strong. And so we're filming this video and it's like, it was our first losing season. <laughs> you know, <we> a, <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, how does this work? But, yeah. <laughs> but I just, you know, because you can't separate who you are, I don't think. Yeah. You are who you are. And so people like, you know, like I've said this before, like I, I pray about certain things in games, not so much to win all the time, but just. Uh, pray about things to you know things that you studied maybe that you could remember just like if anybody of a test or something hey right you know stuff that i work and just you know, just help me to be able to remember things or uh, so i i pray for those kinds of things in my profession and sometimes you know maybe people not of our faith may not recognize it or they may not believe in that which is fine everybody has their own prerogative sure but even sometimes in the church people like no no the Lord doesn't care about what you're doing in the game, doesn't care about your team or whatever. And I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I'm not saying that he's going to make us the national champions or anything. I'm sure. not, that's what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. But I think the Lord's concerned with all of our lives Absolutely. and how we're doing, whatever your profession is. And he wants you to be successful. And I think, you know, and so, you know, as I, because I remember saying that once, you know, we were in a, in a church in a, priest, in a priesthood quorum and talking and, you know, it kind of came up and I mentioned that. And, and the person kind of said, well, you know, you know, the Lord's not really worried about Navy football. And I, I kind of stopped him a little bit. I was like, well, I agree with you. Too, since it's not everything's about Navy football. But I know that the Lord cares about you. Yeah. He cares about you. And, I, you know, I always bring the example of your, raising your crops and stuff that the Lord, he wants to help you. You know what I mean? And, you know, everybody has different crops. Everybody, I mean, you guys, this is how you guys are making a living. And then, you know, you try your best and, you know, hopefully you get some blessings to try to help you along with it. I mean, I know you got to work, but um, so I guess that was a long answer, but I'm, what I'm trying <laughs> to say is it was all me. You know what I mean? It was yeah. all one. I couldn't separate it. Um, my faith, my being a coach, my culture, you know, being Polynesian, being someone, it's, it's just me. And so it's when I did that, like, well, it's, I'm not any different. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm the same person. I'm a fiery person. I'm a competitive person, but I'm just a normal person. I have a lot of flaws. And so I, it wasn't that hard doing those kinds of things because it was, it wasn't a script. It was just, yeah. They yeah. See you at just, church, they see you at work. They see you at, that's me. <laughs> yeah. Just you being you. And, uh, and, you know, you brought up, uh, 
coach Lavelle Edwards. And I think that a lot of us really looked up to him. I mean, I know I did, you know, I grew up <laughs> watching BYU football at a very young age and just watching him on the sidelines. So do you have some people that have inspired you? Um, I I'm assuming coach Edwards being one of those, but do you have a couple of others that, you know, just inspired you, whether they were football coaches or, or just, you know, somebody that you really looked up to that, that kind of helped you be the man and person you are today? Well, first and foremost were my parents, like yeah. a lot of us, you know what I mean? Just, just seeing my parents, my dad, you know, you know, come from American Samoa to a, you know, to a new country to make a new way of life, you know, English being their second language and seeing them work hard. Um, that was, that, that, that had a big impact on me just watching my parents work, both of my parents work. In fact, Jason, I remember, and I sh I've shared this example, and I think it's a pretty powerful one for me. Uh, my freshman year, I was actually going to a private school in town and I lived in the country and it was a two hour bus ride. And my mom went to work in town because she was working at a bank. And I could only do that for one year. You know what I mean? It was mm. too tiring for me to get up early in yeah. the morning uh, by the time you get home from a, you know, a basketball practice, you got to do your homework. It's like eight o'clock or whatever the time is getting off the public bus. And my mom did that for years. And I remember one day just right on the bus with my mom, I got on the bus before her cause we got on different places and I was sitting in the back of the bus. It was completely back packed. I was able to sit down and my mom stood up, you know, she was basically asleep, you know, on her feet mm. and, I just sat back, you know, it's, it's pretty emotional for me to think about that because just see my dear mother just dead tired on her feet, standing, you know, you know, asleep, her head bobbing, holding on to the, the handrails. And I could only do that for a year. I, I told my parents the next year, I, I can't do that anymore. You know, I need to, I can't go to that private school. I can't, it wasn't the school. I just, I couldn't handle the ride. Yeah. And I just thought, here's my mother doing this for years, two hours there, two hours back. She came home and cleaned the house. So it gave me, it was my parents doing that, my dad working. Um, he worked at the Polynesian Cultural Center. He was, a, uh, he was a cook for 23 years in the Coast Guard, but he became the a manager of the first, the Gateway Restaurant, which was the, you know, the big restaurant at the Polynesian Cultural Center. And he didn't know how to be a manager, so to speak. I still remember I went to his house. I mean, uh, I went to the restaurant and my dad was there, but he wasn't in his office. He was down in the kitchen cooking with the cooks. You know what I mean? And so those examples of my parents' work, uh, you know, I, my mother led in love. My dad's example shared to me how to lead. So they were great influences on me. Coach Edwards was a huge influence because when I got into this profession, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm LDS. But I was at UH. I mean, that was the time back in the '80s where, you know, we hated each other. We hated yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny because I, you know, I go to church with all BYU fans and <laughs> and like and stuff, but try to beat them. But being in this profession, I knew how hard it was to to win. But then I saw Coach Edwards that he was winning at a high, high level. I mean, unheard of. I mean, I. I think oh, back yeah. then they wanted to whack like 17 times or whatever. I mean, just ridiculous amount of success. But he's doing it the right way. You know what I mean? He's just, I'm like, wow. So it was a great example for me from afar, seeing how he did things. I'm pretty sure they didn't work on Sunday, even though I don't know that, but I'm pretty sure they didn't. And the rest of the college world was. So those kind of influences on me as I saw from afar, I didn't realize it that when I was young. But when I got into coaching and became a head coach, you just take in all the influences yeah. that you've seen over the course of them. And so my parents, Coach Edwards is a big, you know, my, my coach is Coach Dick Tomey, uh, you know, and, and Bob Wagner and Paul Johnson uh, at, the, at the University of Hawaii had influ a huge influence on me. And the last one I'll share, Jason, is uh, John Robinson. Mm -hmm. You know, when I got fired and went to UNLV, I didn't realize it was a blessing in disguise for me that the Lord really had his hand in that, especially as I look back at now, like I said, Lavelle helped me get that job. But I, was, I worked for John Robertson for three years and I didn't realize it then, but I wasn't 
three years of head coaching, you know, a master's class, a doctorate class from one of the best head coaches <laughs> that ever lived. Yeah. So I would just sit back for three years and just watch this man. You know, there'd be times when Joe Montana or other NFL players would come through Vegas and they always stop by to see Coach Robinson. Hmm. And it kind of had a profound impact on me because I'm thinking, wait a minute, Joe Montana played for the 49ers. They were rivals. He, he was a head coach at the Rams. You know, like, what is he coming by to see Coach Robinson? But they all loved him. You know, you know, Tiger Woods, Charles Barkley, all these celebrities, they knew him. And they were great friends with Coach Robinson. But he, Coach Robinson also talked to the, the janitor or the guy yeah. cleaning the building. You know, I mean, he didn't, there wasn't this hierarchy with him. And I would sit back and look at, man, this man of great status in the eyes of the world. But he was humble enough to talk to the guys cleaning our lockers and just all these different things. And then I realized, you know, people come around that played for him because they loved him. Yeah. Even guys that didn't play for him. He had such great respect. So those guys, like I said, as I look back and I had such great um, um, influence on me because I saw the way they led. They didn't really tell me anything. It didn't sit me down, okay, Ken, let me teach you how to be a head coach or let me right. teach you how to lead. It was just their influence, watching Coach Robinson from afar, uh, Coach Edwards from afar, my parents, my coaches, my head coaches at the Hawaii, Coach uh, Johnson and Coach um, uh, Robinson there. And so all those people, um, but, and I'll just say this, but really the biggest influence on me in my coaching and my leadership style has been the savior. Mm. Yeah. You know, it just, I just think about how the savior led. Uh, there wasn't any coercion. He loved people. He taught, he was merciful. He was forgiving. He held people accountable. Wrong was wrong and right was right. And so, you know, I have a picture on my desk. So just a picture of the savior and he's walking in front of the apostles but he's leading at the front, but there's like, he's not pulling anybody along, but they're following him. And so mm -hmm. he's the, the savior of my, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the savior have been the biggest influence on me in the way I, I coach and in my profession. That's, that's really cool. I have loved the things that you share. I think it, I keep um, being reminded that you're going to, you keep going back to your roots or your foundation um, you know, you've talked a lot about your family and the influence they've had on you, about your faith and, and your religion and those things. And I think that's what grounds us and allows us to be who we are, like you were talking about. You're a head coach of a football team, but that doesn't change who Ken is. You can be yourself and still be that coach. And I just, I've been very inspired by the things that you've said today, Ken. I, I really appreciate what your words and your wisdom and knowledge it's been interesting you know um you know recently so i'm going on my third year being the stake president in my stake and, and so when i first got called i was thinking um how am i gonna do this <laughs> <laughs> i have a hard enough time being a head coach man. yeah <laughs> how am i gonna do this but i just you know i, I trusted the brethren who came and were inspired and so I, I know that they're men of God, and if if that's what they believe in, the Lord's called me, I'm going to do it. And I just remember that, and like I said, I'm just going to share these because this is who I am, and I'm, I'm not embarrassed. Absolutely. Please I do. Just, I, I just remember just having a feeling when I had that thought, like, wow, how am I going to do this? When I was leaving the office after the, you know, the brethren had told my wife and I that they were going to call me to be the stake president, I was still at, I was still walking like, what? I mean, did that just happen? But as I was thinking, how am I going to do this? I had this this vision in my mind. I saw my house. I saw the stake center. And I saw my work. And they're literally within five minutes of each other. And basically, I, just this impression I had is that the Lord is like, don't worry. I've thought this all through. You just do what I tell you. Yeah. You got plenty of time to get to all of it. Don't complain. There are many leaders that got to drive hours, you know, and other countries that got to do stuff. Don't complain. You, you can do this. And I saw that in the first year. There are literally some times that I was coming off the practice field, shower, maybe, you know, 6.30 or 7. And maybe I had my first appointment at 7.30 and I could make it. 
Yeah. You know, and I could get there. And so, so, and then we had our first season as being a, the state president. It was the best year I've ever had in coaching. <laughs> so I was thinking, okay, Lord, I get it. <laughs> just basically, <laughs> Lord, like, don't, don't question, just do it. Yeah. But then this year, we had the worst, my worst year ever. And so it's almost like I've been thinking like, okay, work when things are good, are you faithful? It's easy to be faithful when you, yeah. but it's going to be the same way when things aren't going so well. And I find it interesting because it's what I tell my players all the time, you know, you know, in their leadership position, I say, guys, it's easy to lead when things are going well. And all this, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. But someday you're going to be a father and things are going to break down and, you know, your kids are going to question things and there's going to be a family fight or sickness, or you're going to be a, a, a owner in your company or something happens, or you're going to be a leader of sailor and Marines and things are going to break down. Can you lead them through adversity? And mm-hmm. I found that interesting this year that, you know, that happened. I'll, I'll kind of go back real quick, uh, Jason, Shane, but when I had that interview to, you know, become the state president, as I sat down, I mean, I didn't think it'd be me you know, how they bring certain people to come and I know it's not going to be me. I mean, they've got way more, <laughs> a lot of people way you know, more qualified and more spiritual than me, but I just sat down with the brother and he just asked me just, how's your relationship with the Lord? And I just remember bawling. It was, it was crazy. Cause I came in there like, you know, hi, um, brother Nematololo. Hi, I'm Elisa. So that's great. And how's your relationship with the Lord? And I just started just bawling. And then I started to realize the year before that year, we were having a horrible year and it forced me to get closer to the Lord. Mm-hmm. I'd go early to work. You know, I'd, I'd walk by myself, listen to general conference talks, read scripture just to get my mind right. Just to, cause I know that when I can feel the spirits and that when I feel those promptings, I'm a much better person, a much better father, much better coach. And so I'd go early and because we were doing so bad, um, I, I was going a lot early because I feel like early in my career, the 12 years prior to that, the Lord was, I could always feel things. You know, I, I'd go to the Lord and pray and ask for answers. Lord, can you help me with this? And he, I would receive responses, do this and do that. But this season, I wasn't getting anything. So I remember mm-hmm. asking my wife, she's like, hey, what do you think? What's going on? I said, I don't know. And I know my wife's probably looking at me. Are you doing anything wrong? <laughs> you know what I mean? Just, uh, are you are you doing anything that's prohibiting you from receiving revelation? And you know, but I said, honey, I don't know. I, I, I just you know, I pray for guidance on certain things, and I was just getting blanks. But I didn't realize that that just forced me to get closer and closer. The Lord, I realized now, the Lord hadn't left. I just had to keep doing my part and keep yeah. doing that. And so when, when the brother had asked me that, how's your relationship with the Lord? And I just cried and said, I have never been closer. But if it wasn't for what I was going through, I don't know if I would have humbled myself. Mm-hmm. You know, if we were successful, I don't know if I would have humbled myself. I was reading my scriptures and praying and going to church and fulfilling my callings. But not to the full point where it forced me to basically, I mean, I was desperate, really seeking answers, really getting on my knees and I found that, you know, this year, even with this bad season, I felt like, you know, I, I'm okay because I, my foundation is strong. Um, I know the Lord will help us. I've seen it before, but it's, it's, it's been very interesting for me to see just this whole process of seeing how I kind of look at it like, you know, if you're a farmer and you're, and you had a, a year plentiful, you thank the Lord. Mm-hmm. But maybe you're a farmer and you came somehow your 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 somebody you know your your crops burned. I'm not gonna chastise the Lord. I'll just go plant my plant my seeds again. Yep. You know what I mean it's like okay that's what happened and I'll just keep pressing forward. So it's been a great during this pandemic, during the season that we've had. I felt the Lord buoy me and giving me strength and hope during this time of continuing to you know lead our stake and try to do what the Lord wants me to do. Um, I found it very interesting that there have been two types of leadership, though. Because uh, being a stake president, I don't know, it's kind of crazy. I thought of, I'm a very hands-on, very yeah. detailed. I'm, 
probably a Mac, too much of a micromanager. I, I'm sure I, I, my coach is like, yeah, he, he wants to know everything. You know, just, <laughs> but it's kind of, it's kind of who I am. I'm just very meticulous, very detailed, want to know everything. But it, in my calling, I don't feel that way because mm. this is the Lord's church and he's in charge. I just got to do my best to make sure that I'm worthy. And so I can hear his voice and do what he's want. And, um, and as long as I do that, we'll be fine. You know, so it's, it's kind of interesting, but I, I'm, I'm not stressed out in the church because it's true. And yep. I know I just, just do what I'm supposed to and everything will work out. Where in, this, in my profession, it's a lot, I'm leaving totally different. What, what do you say? What are we doing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what, what, why, why are we eating baked chicken? Should we eat, you know? <laughs> no, Ken, I, I really appreciated, you know, what, what you shared with us and, and getting to know you a little bit better. Um, I, I truly have been inspired with, you know, what you said and, you know, the things you shared, especially, you know, centered around your faith and your family. Um, to me, that's, you know, the center and the core of your life and, and what better thing to have centered around than those things. Right. And so, um, anyway, Shane and I, at the close of, you know, of our interviews, we like to ask two questions. And so we, we refer to this as the double, double down dose. dose. So it's the double down dose. Whoa. Wait, let me, <laughs> let me drink my shake real quick before you. Yeah. Ask yeah, you're good. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. Okay. So we, we ask we asked two final questions. I'll ask one and then Shane will ask the other one. But what is your definition of hope or how would you define hope? That's a great question. Um, define hope as a brighter future, you know, so for, you know, for a brighter future ahead. Um, and really my definition of hope Hope is in Jesus Christ. My definition of hope is always centers on Jesus Christ because through him, all hope is available. So, and like I said, that's my, whether it's in my work, my faith and all walks of life, hope is always centered on Jesus Christ. That's great. That's a great question or a great answer. We, we love to ask these questions. Sometimes we find that people don't think a lot about what hope is or um, so the second part of the double down dose is how would you define love? Just what I just said, hope with, I define love as a savior. You know, I define love as a savior, just that our heavenly father sent his only begotten son, you know, to come and, and his son sacrifice, perform the atonement for all of us. And as a father, I think about that. I can't fathom that, you know, to see, you know, to sacrifice your son. And as a son, for him to do exactly what his father asked him to do, you can see the love of that. So when I think of love, the love in its purest form, again, I think of the Savior. And that type of pure love that's, as you read in the scriptures, that envy is not not puffed up, seek it's not his own. You know, that's what I see of love is just, when I see of love, I, 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 I always think of the savior, look to his life and look to his example. Great. That's awesome. Yeah. have very much enjoyed our discussion with you, Ken. I, I've been very inspired and touched by you and your example. Um, best wishes to you in the coming season and everything you, you, your family and your football team we will be cheering you on and hope the best for you thank you guys um, i really appreciate being here i'm hoping that my crops don't get burned again this year yeah i don't i don't think it will right like like it's looking like it's on the up and up right and so so yeah i definitely we we do wish you the, the best this year and and hope that you know you can get your your cadets all ready to go and and ready to to rock the season and and uh, we'll definitely be cheering you on. And, and uh, thank you so much for taking the time out of, out of your busy, busy day and busy life to, to come and talk to us, Ken. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Enjoy talking to you guys. You guys take care. Be safe. we Will do.